Hi, everyone. Um, we are going to start the revolution part of our Warren Revolution unit. So we have um, finished talking about absolutism and what happens uh, to create rulers like that and how they're able to have absolute power. So we are going to now move on to talking about a couple of different revolutions. We'll talk about the French, uh, the English, the Russian, and the Chinese. We can do like a real brief review of American, but you should know it by now because you've had it like four times and you'll have it again next year. Um, um, but before we start, uh, hopefully you read the instructions. Uh, there are going to be five questions to answer. Uh, from this lecture series on the causes of the French Revolution questions and they go right in order so if you want to take a minute pause this open up the document and you can answer the questions um, while you are going through the lecture okay so all right the causes of the French Revolution so first we'll review what is absolutism um, so remember, that's when your ruler makes all the decisions with little regard for the people as well as little regard for the consequences. They don't really care what happens. Um, they just want what they want. Um, you can see that it, the pictures I had put up for you. Hopefully, you'll be able to recognize them. Uh, on the left is Henry VIII of England. If you remember from the lecture when I told you that they made paintings later of him and his wife Jane and their son Edward, that's one of those uh, famous paintings. But remember, she wouldn't have been there. She died in childbirth. Uh, in the middle, you have a statue of Peter the Great. And on the right, you have a um, picture of Louis the Fourteenth, the guy who starts it all with the French Revolution. Um, and I really love this picture because it highlights one of his many inventions, the high heels, um, not in the sense of creating... The concept of high heel, like obviously they had that like way back in Egyptian times, but uh, the concept that it can be wore for fashion, he actually uh, was fairly short, so he had those shoes specifically designed to make him appear um, uh, more imposing. But then because he was wearing them, everyone else started wearing them, and pretty soon he was short again because everyone else was wearing high heels as well. You see, eventually males stop wearing those heels, uh, but women will continue. Um, all thanks to Louis the Fourteenth. Yeah. So let's uh, on the next slide. We're going to quickly review what he did. Remember, he rules from sixteen forty three to seventeen fifteen. That's about seventy years. Um, he didn't rule all of that when he was younger. There was a regent, but um, he did rule for a big chunk of that time. During his rule, he greatly reduced the power of the nobility. And uh, remember, he played all those mind games with him. Uh, he is going to greatly increase France's national debt. He'll do that in two ways. Number one, his nickname was, yes, the Sun King. So he spent a lot of money um, on creating the Palace of Versailles and decorating it in gold. And then the second way he is going to greatly increase that debt is with the next bullet point which is he engaged France in four separate wars um, and war when it first starts can be a big money maker because if you're a um, weapons manufacturer uh, and that's part of the state economy that's going to help but the longer it goes on the more money it will cost to maintain okay. so when he eventually dies okay um, Louis the Fifteenth will take over. He's not that much better for France. Um, oh, he's right. He's a great grandson of Louis the Fourteenth because remember, um, he lived so long that his own son and grandson had already uh, passed away. Um, which would be an interesting topic, primogeniture. If anyone wants to remind me, if you show up for the live meet, uh, I can talk to you about how people actually inherit the throne um, and all that fun stuff. So Louis the Fifteenth, it's interesting. He is going to inherit the throne at the age five, just like his great grandpa. Um, and people say, "Oh man, it's going to be more of the same thing." And the right, um, he's not going to take control until the age of thirty-three. Uh, so remember, Louis the Fourteenth waited a long time. He waited till he was twenty-three, which um, seems excessive until you find out about Louis the Fifteenth, uh, where he really didn't want to be in charge. 
And he's not really known for much. He doesn't create giant palaces um, or show off in that way. But he does um, have France involved in a very famous conflict uh, known as the Seven Years' War in England uh, and France because it lasted seven years. Um, however, it wasn't just between France and England. It was about their colonies. Um, it was fought in Europe, India, and North America, and it was all about colonial expansion um, and who's going to take over the world. You might remember um, learning about the Seven Years' War without actually remembering it because you would have learned about it in U.S. history as the French and Indian War uh, because that's from the American perspective. Um, but that war will last. I'm going to switch you over because my arm's getting tired. Uh, that war will last... Um, from 1756 to 1763, again, seven years, um, and really it's, it's going to be terrible for France. Uh, they're going to lose. Uh, Great Britain is going to become the most powerful country in Europe, and not only are they going to lose all that prestige, they're going to greatly increase the national debt, which had already been run up by Louis XIV. The 15th is going to do the same thing. So it's important to talk about uh, what was happening in the government in France at this time because even though you have absolute monarchs, that doesn't mean there's no other form of government. In France, they have the Estates General. So the Estates General is France's version of Congress. Okay, um, And uh, it was the one that was supposed to be making the laws and the rules about taxes and and regular how you act as citizens um but it all was run with the permission of the king so for general setup the estates general is split into three estates the first estate is made up of the clergy so that means um the church the catholic church and all church land and um money that they would have gained um is all represented in the first estate the second estate is the nobility, okay? Um, so that's all of your people with titles uh, and big, large estates who also would have had smaller villages underneath them. And then the third estate is the commoners, which is your everyday people, your peasants, your serfs, people who would have uh, just worked. Um, and they're kind of the ones that get pushed down. Now, it's important to note that when you look at them percentage-wise, it's flipped. So population-wise, the first and second estate makes up about 10% of the population, and the third estate makes up about 90% of the population. So 90% of the people would identify themselves as being in the third estate. With that, 90% of the wealth existed in the first and second estate um and the last 10 percent, probably even a little bit lower existed within the common people okay. here's the problem at that point the third estate was the only estate that paid taxes so the people who had 10 percent of the wealth were the ones who were paying for the entire country um which is bad enough as it is but uh, you will also start to see a series of crop failures where they simply are not growing enough to sell and they're not growing enough to eat. Um, so the third estate is really starting to falter. Um, you can see from the image uh, on the slide. Can I flip it? Yeah. So the image on the slide is a famous painting where you see the third estate um, in chains and blindfolded and they're basically carrying the the military and the clergy and the nobles all on its back okay all right at that time period hopefully you remember this from us gov someone taught it to you fingers crossed you also had this new wave of thinking called the enlightenment so these were new ideas about society and government you have um, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. And in France, you have Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So Rousseau is going to come up with the social contract. And it's this very simple idea. 
Um, it's the idea that people give up freedom in exchange for protection from the government. Um, so they agree to give up some of their rights in order for the government to protect the rest of their rights. Okay, And this is just the social contract. We agree to um, work with people uh, for the betterment of everyone. Okay? But there's a second part of that. The idea is, if that's what the agreement is, if the government is not doing its job, okay, so it's not protecting the people, then the people can overthrow it. And that is a revolutionary idea. Okay. That would be another good topic we talk about in the live session if you are interested um, in how we give up freedoms and what does that actually look like in today's society. Okay. Uh, Okay, so you have the Enlightenment happening. The reason you learn about it in U.S. Gov is because it was also the same exact time period for the American Revolution. Okay. So the American Revolution happens to, uh, like 13 years before the French Revolution. And it's important to note that when you're taught it in U.S. history, a lot of times it's a big focus on the American colonists and how we just wanted to be listened to and we threw tea in the harbor and we had pitchforks and they had guns and they lost and all that stuff. But sometimes it gets glossed over that we had a lot of support from France. Um, there, was, there wasn't an official support. The king was not willing to say, yeah, we need to go to support them, even though they hated England. Okay. Um, but he didn't pay attention or care when wealthy um, uh, nobles uh, basically supported the American Revolution, including some of them when you have, um, on the image you have the Marquis de Lafayette, who uh, is very famous. There's actually a Lafayette, um, Lafayette Street in uh, Washington, D.C. because of how much help he gave. He, he gave his own personal fortune, which today would have been worth millions of dollars, to help the Americans um, with the revolution. And on one hand, you can see that it's about kind of practicing for your own revolution, um, in the sense of let's try it out in America and see if it'll work, and then we could do it in France. But on the other hand, when you think of it realistically from a, a personal impact, I mean, these, these people were giving up um, a lot of money and risking their own lives for the revolution. So it, it was more than, than just practicing for France's revolution. Uh, in the, and, and with this connection, you see a lot of those revolutionary ideals coming back to France and kind of pushing that that question on should should they have their own revolution um i'm sure there were many in france who hoped that with all the support that they were giving america that when america won and then france had their revolution they would support them as well spoiler we did not do that we kind of pretended like they didn't exist and they didn't just help us win our war and we still kind of do that sometimes um so when this is happening, so the American Revolution, 1776, fingers crossed you knew that date, uh, it is right after the new king is crowned in France. So Louis XVI will inherit the throne in 1774. And he is going to be someone who had been raised in the Enlightenment. He actually supports it a lot. And you do see him trying to make France better. He's going to do a lot of things. He's going to get rid of serfdom. So what's a serf? Yes, a peasant bound to the land. He says that's not a thing anymore. You can go and move wherever you want. He also gets rid of Thai, um, which was a tax on the common people. It was literally just a tax for being poor. If you made less than a certain amount of money, you were taxed on it, which I don't even understand. Um, and then you also see him encouraging tolerance of non-Catholics. So remember Louis XIV when start, things started to go south? Who did he blame? The Huguenots, non-Catholics. Um, and that had still been going on, and, and Louis the Sixteenth said, no, that's not nice or right in any way, shape, or form. So let's get rid of that. So he does try and open up France in that sense, but he still 
is very excessive in his lifestyle. Um, you can see from the the pretty picture, he's got the giant robe and the nice stockings. Um, and more importantly, he does not listen to his financial advisor. Okay, so by the time Louis the Sixteenth takes over, France is financially crippled. Um, they have massive debt from all those wars, and there's not a lot of money coming in. And they're going to have a financial advisor to the king, uh, a man named Jacques Necker. Uh, and he is going to come up with some ideas on how to help uh, fix the kingdom. And he's, they're going to be crazy ideas. He's going to say you need to balance taxes. Basically, you can't just tax all the poor people. You have to tax the rich people too. Um, and then he's going to throw in the idea that you should slow government spending. Um, maybe not spend money you don't have. So those ideas will get him fired. Okay, And this is when you start to see that turn. Instead of the peasants just accepting it, they start to, to speak out and get very upset. So the government will rehire Necker and um, say, you know, no, we'll, sorry, we'll listen. What do you want? And he'll say the same things again. You need to stop all the spending and you need to tax the wealthy. And they're going to fire him again. Um, and so he's fired, he's rehired, he's fired again. And it's just this crazy story going on um, that all of France knows about. And what becomes interesting is he really starts to represent um, to the average person, to the common people. He represents what they're struggling with to, to be told that, they need to do what they're supposed to do and then they're not listened to and everything he's saying is correct and would help but it doesn't matter because it's it's not coming from who they feel is an important person so he really starts to represent the struggle of the common man against this absolute monarchy which is failing um, so what will happen is Louis the Sixteenth will decide to call these states general. So remember, Louis the Fourteenth never called these states general. It's like having a congress, but it can't start unless the king says yes, you can meet. Louis the Sixteenth will say yes, you can meet, and everyone's excited about this, particularly the lower class, because they feel like they're going to get listened to. However, there's a problem with the voting system. So there, the states general is split up into the three estates. Each estate gets one vote, okay? which means every single time there is a vote, the first and second always vote together. So it doesn't matter what the third wants. Unless the first and second estate want that to happen, it's not going to happen okay? because it's always stacked against them. Even though the third estate represents 90% of the population okay, and the majority of the taxes, they're always outvoted. So they're going to meet in Versailles in May of 1789, and there's going to be this big voting controversy. Basically, the third estate had started speaking out and saying it's simply unfair because the first and second always vote together and we're never listened to. So before the meeting happens, the king says that he's going to make some changes and he's going to allow the third estate to bring twice as many representatives. So the way you look at it would be the first and second estate would have half the representatives and the third estate would have the other half of representatives. And they're excited about this because in worst case scenario, they would come to a tie, okay? And they would have to negotiate with that. It would give them actual voting power, okay? When they show up to the meeting, they find out that the king allow them to bring twice as many representatives, but they still only got one vote. So you have twice as many people there with the same amount of not being listened to. Okay. So what's going to happen is the third estate is basically going to say, I'm done. I'm just done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. If they had memes back then, they would have been thrown. But... Uh, they're going to say, you know what? We pay all the taxes. We do all the work. We're going to make our own government. 
and they're going to walk out. Okay. Um, so less than a month later, you'll see them creating what will be known as the National Assembly. Okay. So on June 17, 1789, the National Assembly becomes the new form of government in the sense of 90% of the people in France followed that government. And this terrifies the other classes because just like you can see in the image, another very famous painting or sketch, you see the nobles and the clergy and they are um, deathly afraid of the third estate they have pushed on the ground who is now surrounded by weapons. Because even if they didn't have weapons, they're 90% of the population. They could just run you over and crush you. Um, and that was their greatest fear. And they just kept pushing. They just kept pushing. They didn't think about it. So the National Assembly means business. Okay. So here's what's going to happen. And this, and this is, again... Um, what's wonderful with France is you get some example, you get some real examples of how an absolute monarchy um, really is out of touch with the people. So I'm not making this up. Really happens. Louis the Sixteenth okay, is going to order that the Third Estate be locked out of the National Assembly's meeting hall. So they said we're all going to meet here and we're going to fix this government. So his idea to stop that was to lock the doors. Because if you can't get in, you can't have a meeting. Does that make any That doesn't make any sense. It's like, I don't even know. So they show up, and the doors are locked, and there's guards there. I'm like, really? Um, we're still going to have the meeting. So what they do is they go across the street to the tennis courts. Um, back then, tennis courts were not open courts. There's just a big room with that. Tennis was a real thing, very popular back then. Uh, and they're going to go into the to the tennis courts and they're going to take the tennis court oath, which is basically we're a government. We are sitting here and we will not leave until the king acknowledges that we exist and he needs to bargain with us. Um, and basically the king is going to reverse his position. He's going to say, OK, sorry, I locked the doors. I'll listen to you. Um and he sets up to meet with him. While he's doing that, he's also having his military start training. And they're just going to have them start stockpiling weapons um, in a very large prison that they have in the area. <coughs> just in case. Um, because he's going to try and work with the peasants. But not really. He's not going to listen. So he's getting ready to crush them. He just needs enough time. Uh, and enough weaponry to deal with it. Okay. So, early July hits. It's very hot. They're starting to have bread shortages. So people are hot and they're hungry. It's the ultimate hangry. And they're still unhappy, but they're willing to work with it. The National Assembly feels like the king's going to listen to them. And then... They fire Jacques Necker again, and they they just lose it. They just, they're, again, I'm done, I'm done. This is ridiculous. Let's go stab some people. Um, and that's literally what's going to happen. They're just going to start stabbing. Anyone who looks like they are a guard or in the military or the nobility, they're just getting chased by people in the street, um, literally being torn apart. And this, you get this whole mob mentality taking over, and they're just they're destroying France. And then they look to the great symbol of tyranny in France, which is their giant prison, the Bastille. And the Bastille had been used for many years as a prison, but more recently, it had been used for political prisoners, meaning. Besides your regular criminals, you are also having people who are thrown in jail because they said something bad about King Louis the Sixteenth or something bad about the first or second estate. Um, and they weren't given trial. They're just thrown in there, and, and some, it was assumed, would stay there for the rest of their lives. And your family's just destroyed because of it, and now you're angry, and you finally have something to stab people with. So you head towards the Bastille, 
And on July 14th, you have the very famous storming of the Bastille because again, it doesn't matter how many weapons you have if you have 90% of the population and they kind of just, they just run into the Bastille. Um, people are being killed. They're slamming down the, the gates. They kill the guards um, and they go in there to release all the prisoners. Yes, they're also going to release the regular criminals. Hopefully there weren't any serial killers in there. Um, but they're going to release all the political prisoners and say, we're not listening to you anymore. Do you remember a little while ago when I told you that the king told the military to start stockpiling weapons? Guess where they put them. So you have all these peasants running in to free the criminals, sorry, political prisoners, and say, you know what, we're just going to run them over, we're going to beat them with sticks, and they run into the Bastille. Never mind, we have guns, let's go shoot them. Uh, and it's just massive bloodshed. Um, you'll see this happening in the city, um, and that's the storming of the Bastille. It's going to be followed by the Great Fear, um, because it's just going to spread out into the countryside. And all of these farmers and peasants and former serfs are just going to start going after the nobles. Um, everything's getting lit on fire. It's just a crazy, crazy time. And it's just the start of the revolution. It's just going to get worse from there. Um, so hopefully you were able to answer all those questions. If not, you can always go back through this lecture and uh, find it. And of course, always you can email if you need to. Hope you enjoyed the story today. And I will see you next class.